السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وبعد You may have uh, seen on the poster that the topic of discussion for this afternoon is on lessons in leadership. Now you may be aware that this year 2024, this calendar year, has been described as the year in which the most elections will take place globally. Here in South Africa recently we had also our own national and provincial elections. And elections are about electing leaders. Who is going to lead us politically? That's what elections are about. But the first point that I want to address is that we should move beyond this concept that leadership only has to do with occupying the highest political office. So that the discussion around leadership, we erroneously assume, will only relate to those who want to be an MP or a mayor or a councillor or a president or a minister or something of that sort. All of us are leaders in some way or the other already in our lives. And even if we don't pursue politics or we don't embark on a political career, life will give us some sort of leadership role to play or the other. So therefore, it is imperative for us to understand that what are the core ingredients of a successful leader. And the earlier in life you understand that, the better you are able to build on those qualities within yourself and ensure that you become more effective in leading in whichever capacity you are expected to lead. So there's a hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wherein the Nabi of Allah says, Kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'oolun an ra'iyati. Every one of you is a shepherd. Every one of you will be responsible for his or her flock. Meaning, in life, you will have to lead someone. As a parent, you would have to lead your child. As a teacher, you would have to lead your student. As a manager, you would have to lead the people that you are managing. If you go down the religious field as an imam, you would have to lead your congregation. So every one of us will have to play some sort of a leadership role or the other. The question is how effectively will we play that leadership role? So the first thing I want to share with you is that in life we must understand there's a difference between a ruler and a leader. There's a big difference between a, a, a ruler and a leader. For example, a leader emerges amongst people. A ruler campaigns amongst people. A ruler is the one that who will have to spend money to captivate you in order for you to vote for him or her. But a leader displays such qualities, such characteristics that they emerge. People gravitate towards them and say, we would like for you to lead us. A leader derives his appeal from humility. A ruler derives his appeal from superiority. Think about it. Those who hanker after leadership, not because they are suited for it necessarily or because they have the qualities for it, just because they desire it and they see it as a vehicle and as a conduit towards achieving something for themselves, they are the ones who have a superiority complex. I am better than him or I am better than everyone else. Whereas a leader is always humble. When Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu was appointed the Khalifa after the demise of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we are all aware that he was the greatest human after the Anbiya Ali Musallatu wasalam. But if you look at his inaugural address, if you look at his opening statement, he said, O oh people, I have been appointed as a ruler over you, although I am not the best of you. That was his humility. We know that he was the best of people, but he never considered himself such. Another difference between a ruler and a leader is that a leader's hallmark is mercy, a ruler's hallmark is authority. A ruler will have that attitude of my way or the highway. You don't tow my line, you're gone. A ruler, a leader rather, will genuinely be concerned about the well-being of others. And if you look at how Allah describes Rasulullah sallallahu himself in the Quran, that Allah says, لَقَدْ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ A Nabi has come to you from amongst you. عَزِيزٌ عَلَيْهِ مَا عَنِتُّمْ Your difficulty, he makes it his own difficulty. That's a quality of leaders. They worry about your well-being. Harisun alaykum. He's always worried about you. Bil mu'minin ra'ufur rahim. And when it comes to the believers in specific, he is most beneficent. He is most merciful. So there are many differences. I've just highlighted a few. 
uh, a leader is reliable, a ruler is reliant, a, re a leader is free from greed, a ruler thrives on greed. And there are differences that we need to understand. But that's the first point, that endeavor to be a leader and to understand what the qualities of a leader are, don't ever try and become a ruler. The second thing we need to understand is that first and foremost, leaders build their own spiritual capacity and they try to enhance the spiritual capacity of the people that they are leading. This is a distinguishing factor between the qualities of a leader as enshrined in Islam and the qualities of a leader as espoused by everyone else who doesn't share the faith. Because in Islam we believe that no matter what you do and how effectively you do it, it will never be successful until it's not blessed with acceptance by Allah. And acceptance from Allah comes in the form of barakah. And barakah will only come proportionate to your level of obedience. Proportionate to the strength of your relationship with Allah. So you can have the best formal qualifications. You can have the best EQ, you know, soft skills. You can have everything. You can go for the best causes. But you will never be as successful as you could be if you don't have the backing of Allah. If you don't have the assistance of Allah. And that's why for us as believers, a true leader is one who's constantly working on the state of his own relationship with his maker. And when he comes to the people that he leads, he's constantly enhancing the state of their own relationship with Allah. So you can be a manager, manager in your business, right? But if you're not performing your salah, and you're not ensuring that your staff, Muslim staff, are performing their salah, then you don't have the foundation for success. Even though you may have the best business plan, you may have the best staff, most qualified, most experienced, most talented, everything else. You will not be as successful as you can be or you should be if you don't have that strong relationship with Allah. The one thing that we will all agree that is lacking in the Ummah is unity. Right? Anywhere you go in the world, everyone is be bemoaning the fact that there's no human unity. If there was unity in the Ummah, then the Palestinians wouldn't be facing the plight that they face. We're not short of numbers. There are 2 billion Muslims and counting, rising. Right? We're not short of resources. The amount of wealth that certain Muslim countries had or have now has never been seen in the annals of Islamic history. So we are bigger in number now than ever before. We are richer now than ever before. We have strategic locations more now than ever before. Yet 2 billion Muslims can't uh, release 1 million Muslims from, from genocide, from occupation, from oppression. Why? Because we're not united. Unity has many factors to it. But Allah himself says in the Quran, وَأَلَّفَ بَيْنَ قُلُوبِهِمْ Allah is the one who unites hearts. So, true unity will only be achieved if you have the backing of Allah. And the backing of Allah will come proportionate to your level of obedience to Allah. To your own levels of taqwa. So, if you want the ummah to be united, you have to start with yourself. To what extent am I obedient to Allah? Then to what extent am I willing to forgive my own brother, my own colleague and to close ranks with him, to forgo the petty and to look at the bigger picture? Unity starts from the bottom up. It never happens from the, bot from the top down. We're all waiting for global leaders to unite us. No, be a leader in your own space. If we can't be united in one congregation, we can't be united in one campus, we can't be united in one family, we can't be united in one masjid, in one community, where will the ummah ever be united? So a leader works on his own spiritual capacity and he enhances the spiritual capacity of the people that he leads. Another quality of a leader is that they try and bridge the gap. They try and minimize differences. They try and reconcile between people. They don't pour fuel on the differences because it makes them more relevant. So what a ruler will do, right? If a ruler is a president, for example, if his two ministers are at each other's necks, he'll say it's good because it makes each one of them more reliant on me. And each one of them will try and appease me. That's what a ruler does. But the leader, Rasulullah was a leader. Whenever people had differences, Nabi Sallallahu tried to reconcile between them. He tried to bring them closer because he understood the bigger picture. That I need a united community of Sahaba and companions in order to be able to do the job that Allah wants me uh, to do. Leaders motivate. They're not... Passive, you know, because of difficulties and circumstances. Le true leaders emerge when there's difficulty. It's easy to be a leader when everything is flowing smoothly. It's easy to be a leader when everything is going well, right? But it's in stormy seas. It's in rough waters. It's when there are setbacks. It's when the climate around you is difficult. 
It's when key individuals leave the company or leave the party, as we saw yesterday, that is when you see true leaders emerge. They are able to not trivialize the problem. You can't wish it away. You can't say, ah, no worry, it's nothing. No. They are willing to assess the problem, acknowledge the problem, keep it in proportion, but then at the same time, be solution orientated. Be constructive in how they deal with the challenges and difficulties. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, from the time he proclaimed Nubuwa, from the time he said that Allah has sent me with a mission and with a message, he had problem after problem, challenge after challenge, right up till his last breath. The challenge has changed. In Makkah, it was persecution. In Medina, it was infiltration. You had the Munafiqeen and the hypocrites infiltrating the, the ranks of the believers and trying to cause chaos and havoc from within. But Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always re remained positive. He always continued to, to motivate the Sahaba. What Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did, remember there was a time when the, when the Sahaba was so weak that they couldn't keep out the enemy except by digging a trench. There was no food. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had three stones tied to his own belly. But at that time, he was predicting the fall of the Roman and the Persian Empire at the hands of his own followers. That was his optimism in the midst of all that difficulty, in the midst of all those challenges and gloom. And it wasn't long thereafter in the time of Umar radiallahu an that that actually happened. Another quality is that leaders don't run down other leaders. You see, when you're insecure, then you make it your occupation, actually you make it your obsession to run down others. Because you want people to focus on you and not to focus on them. That is what a ruler does. A leader doesn't do that. A leader understands that I must work on the talents that I have. And I must work on the people that are willing to be with me and who follow me. What others do, that is their prerogative. What they achieve, what they don't achieve, that is for them to answer in front of Allah. Wa ta'ala. Today, we have the sickness in our community, which is not good for the community. We are very quick to promote people and you know to put them on a pedestal and then as soon as there's one whatsapp message that starts to circulate one rumor the very people who put the individual on the pedestal want to break him and bring him down then we want to know why is it that the next generation of youngsters don't have any confidence because we're not leaving them with any role models leaders will err they will make mistakes they are humans they are flawed there's a constructive way of trying to remedy the shortcomings of your leaders and there's a destructive way about just just being sensationalist about it and just being part of the gossip mill and the rumor cycle so we don't leave anyone unscathed everyone now as soon as he enjoys some prominence as soon as he's given some position he becomes a target target of accusation a target of slander a target of rumors many times it's not even true but even if it's true it's not dealt with constructively and that's not healthy for generation of leaders, for production of leaders. You take any youngster who has achieved, right? Let's say sports. You ask him, oh, what made you become passionate about cricket? As an example, there was some cricketer that he idolized when he was growing up. What made you enter the politics, the field of politics? There was some politician that he idolized when he was growing up. We remove all the role models from the equation by knocking them all the time via social media. And then we expect for there to be a production of a generation of leaders who will lead us on multiple fronts. That, that is not a realistic expectation. Leaders are not selfish. Rulers are selfish. Leaders develop other leaders. You know, today even non-Muslims write that the world needs an Umar. Such was his impact in the 10 years that he was Amir al-Mu'minin. But what's Umar's story? There was a time when Umar was the greatest opponent of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yet Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam didn't write him off. The Nabi of Allah lifted up his hands and he made dua and he said, "Oh Allah, this man Umar and the other one Amr, that was Abu Jahl, they have great talent. If not both of them, at least let one of them accept Islam so they can strengthen the effort of Deen." You see, a leader is not selfish. A leader doesn't say, "Oh, who's harmed me and who's been good to me?" So I only surround myself with people who are yabasas, who are good to me, who pat me on the back all the time, who are echoing praise of me. And all those who are in any way antagonistic or aggressive towards me, then I want to eliminate them. No. Nabi Sallallahu said, this man's got talent. Of course he had a shortcoming. He was, he was, he was opposing the greatness of Allah's creation. But Nabi Sallallahu focused more on his talent and made dua for him. And then when Umar became a Muslim, he was the 40th person to accept Islam. The 40th. By the time he passed on, 
he was second only to Abu Bakr. Why? Because Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi didn't write him off. He saw his talent, brought him to Islam, nurtured his talent to the point that the Nabi of Allah then told him, لو كان بعدي نبيا لكان عمر. If there was a Nabi to come after me, or Umar, it would be you. And that's why Umar had the impact that he had. The achievement of Umar in reality is tribute to the leadership of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Somebody once said that when a leader dies and people say there's no one to fill his shoes, it's not a compliment, it's an insult. Because a true leader will always ensure that there will be someone who can adequately fill his shoes. The mission and the cause is always greater than the individual. The mission and the cause is always greater than the individual. Leaders are courageous, but they are not reckless. They are courageous, but they are not reckless. See, there's the story of Dawud alayhi salatu wasalam, right? The famous story of David and Goliath. So the two armies are facing each other. And the suggestion is made, listen, why must we suffer casualties on both sides? Let your strongest soldier come forward. And in that case, it was Jalut, Goliath. And let someone from this side come forth. And whoever wins the duel between the two, their army is considered to be victorious and Jerusalem is theirs for the taking. Now, Goliath, Jalut, had a reputation that preceded him. He was a mountain of a man. He was undefeated. He was strong. He was aggressive, brutal in the battlefield. No one from the opposite side, no one from the army of Talut, Saul, was willing to take him on. And you have this young man, Dawud alayhi salam, he stands up and says, I'll take him on. Courage. Right? But not reckless courage. So we know the story. It's the lesson behind it that I want to uh, highlight. When this happened, Goliath, Jalut, he says to Dawud alayhi salam, come, come. He was calling him closer. He wanted to go into direct hand-to-hand -hand combat. Dawud alayhi salam never, never went. He shot him from a distance with the catty as we know, right? And hit him on the head and killed him. Why did he do that? Because he knew that he had a cataract problem. He knew that Dawud alayhi salatu wasalam had weak eyesight. And that Dawud alayhi salatu wasalam, Dawud alayhi salam knew that Jalut had weak eyesight. And that he couldn't see far. If he came close and went into hand to hand combat, it would have been reckless. He was setting himself up for defeat. So he was courageous, but not reckless. He shot him at a distance. He played to his own advantage. When Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam dug the trench on the advice of Salman Fatsir, which I've just explained to you, when the Meccans came, they were caught by surprise, the Ahzab, the Confederates. And they said, Oh Muhammad, what is this? Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Arabs are brave. We fight hand to hand, man to man. Come across. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never went across. At that time, it was not to the advantage of the Muslims to go across and engage in hand to hand combat because they were outnumbered and they were outgunned, so to speak. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam stood on his side of the trench. There was a reason why they dug the trench and they stayed true to that reason. So a leader will be courageous, but not foolish and reckless. That's, that's another quality that we have to remember. Lastly, let me say, as my time is almost up, and that is, leaders always look at the bigger picture. They forgo the petty. See, Dawud Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, or Yusuf Alayhi Salatu Wasalam, Look at how his own brothers had harmed him. They took him from the lap of his father, dropped him into the bottom of a well. From there he got sold as a slave. From there he got accused of adultery. He languished for many years in prison. Now when he's on the throne of Egypt and they're coming to him with their begging bowls, he shows leadership. He shows that he's a leader and he's not a ruler. He didn't choose revenge. He chose forgiveness because he understood that I've got to take a nation and guide them through seven years of drought towards prosperity on the other side. So not only did he forgive his brothers, he asked Allah to forgive them and he made an excuse for them. And we see the same thing in Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's time. When the Nabi of Allah came to the very Makkah, where they persecuted him for 13 years, where they targeted and killed Sumayyah, where they oppressed Bilal, where they threw Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's own daughter Zainab radiallahu anha off the camel, where they tortured Fatima in the three years of boycott. Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't choose revenge. He said, I've got an ummah to build. I've got a nation to build. He forgave them.
because he focused on the bigger picture. He could have taken revenge, but then he wouldn't have prospered and succeeded on the macro level by getting embroiled in the micro issues. It was not about him, it was about the cause, it was about the mission. And that's the difference between a, a ruler and a leader. A ruler comes into office, a ruler occupies a particular position, a ruler gets a particular title in the community, and the first thing he wants to do is settle scores. Eliminate the people he doesn't like. Promote the people he likes. A leader all says, I'll work with everybody who can assist the cause and who can assist the mission. Lastly, let me tell you, we live in very difficult times as an ummah. But what's the way forward? And I'll share with you one thing which talks to leadership and conclude on this. See, there's a lot of things that have been spoken about and are being spoken about and will be spoken about and they are all valid in their respective contexts in terms of the blueprint for the ummah to come out of the situation that it finds itself in globally. Right? We can all say leadership, but what kind of leadership? This ummah, like I said early on, is bigger in number than ever before. Two billion, they say, in the next 20, 30 years, will probably be the biggest faith, faith group on, on the planet. Richer than ever before. More strategically located in terms of resources than ever before. Yet we are more enslaved now than we were ever before. Why? Because in every field and in every science, we are dependent on others and they are dependent on us. We prospered as an ummah when in every field and in every science, we were the leaders. We were independent of others and they were dependent on us. So, like I said in the beginning, leadership is not only about occupying political office. Leadership doesn't mean you must be the imam of the masjid necessarily. Leadership means you will pursue this world. You will pursue your profession. You will pursue your career. But for the sake of akhirat. You will do the best that you can with excellence. If it's law, if it's medicine, pursue it. But pursue it with excellence. Do it to the best of your ability. However, not only for a worldly motive, but for the greater motive of the after. That I will benefit the ummah and I will benefit humanity. Money will come. The position will come. The status will come. So you are in that phase of your life where you have chosen a particular career path. You may be moving now into a particular career. My message to you is imbibe these qualities of leadership within you. Wherever life is taking you, lead. Lead with excellence. And lead with a greater purpose. Understand the greater mission. When we will become leaders in every field, on every front, in every science, in every profession, then we will be independent. When we are independent of others, then we dictate the terms. And when we dictate the terms, it will be dictated on the basis of justice, on the basis of values, not on the basis of political interest and on the basis of financial interest like we see in the world today. With all the democratic institutions and with all the advancements, why is it that a genocide is still taking place? Because the bigger powers are doing what is in their political interests, what is in their financial interests, not what is in the interests of justice and fairness and equality. So become a leader in whichever direction life is going to take you. You will make a difference. You will leave a legacy. You will enjoy the fruits of it in this world. And you will see the rewards of it in the year after. Inshallah. May Allah grant us all the tawfiq. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Muhammad.